Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Anticoagulation Forum uh, webinar today, uh, Thursday, January 11th. Uh, in our webinar today, we are going to be presenting updates from the ASH annual meeting uh, in 2023 uh, with a focus on thrombosis uh, presentations at that meeting. I will be moderating. I'm Jean Connors. I um, have a number of anticoagulation and antithrombotic uh, leadership roles at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where I work as a hematologist. And I'm professor of medicine at Harvard uh, Medical School. With me today, co-moderating is Naomi Yates, uh, who's a manager of the clinical pharmacy services uh, in and the outpatient pharmacy anticoagulation service at Kaiser Permanente. She has years of experience in the anticoagulation uh, world. Our presenters today are uh, three presenters who had different uh, types of oral presentations at the American Society Hematology Meeting. Hope Pritchett uh, will be uh, Hope Pritchett Wilson will be leading us off today uh, with her oral presentation. She's assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Our next presenter will be Keith McRae, Director of Classical Hematology at the Cleveland Clinic. And our last presenter will be Jordan Schaefer, Associate Professor of Internal Medicine uh, at the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Michigan. Now, um, our agenda for this afternoon's webinar is uh, I will give you a brief overview of the ASH meeting in the next few minutes. Um, our presenters are uh, here, as you see them ordered, uh, with the titles of their presentations. We will have a panel discussion and a chat discussion at, at the end of the presentations. So please uh, place your questions uh, in the chat box uh, and we will be happy to address as many uh, as we can. Now, um, this year's uh, 65th ASH annual meeting uh, was held in San Diego, uh, California. And I have to say that uh, this was probably the best ASH meeting I've been to in four years, uh, not in part due to the fact that I think we are all finally uh, feeling less anxiety about meeting in person post-COVID. The ASH meeting had over 33,000 in-person uh, participants, and there were a wide variety of programs for everybody who attended. I was the educational co-chair uh, for the, the education program. The, I led the development of the sessions in what we call uh, non-malignant classical benign hematology, use any adjective that you would like, uh, and sprinkled throughout, not only in the education program, but in the scientific program, in the oral abstract presentation sessions, and even special interest sessions, we had a wide variety of uh, topics on thrombosis and hemostasis. And you are going to hear uh, some of the most important presentations uh, in the next hour. So I'm going to turn this over now to Hope Wilson, uh, who will be uh, presenting on the use and outcomes of secondary anticoagulation in patients less than 21 years old following completion of a primary course of anticoagulation for treatment of acute provoked VTE, findings from the multinational KIDS DOT trial. Hope? Thank you, Jean. So again, I'm Hope and I'll be discussing findings from the, the kids that trial, which was a landmark pediatric trial that has changed the way that we are able to treat a subset of children who have provoked VTE. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but um, to the left, you'll see um, back in 2001 to 2009, Dr. Ruffini and her group looked at um, the rates of acquired, hospital acquired thromboses in children, we all seem to have noticed that there were more. And at that time, using the FIS database, she found a 70% increase in the rates of hospitalized VTE. And then to the top um, right, Dr. Carpenter and her group was looking around the same time, specifically at pulmonary embolism, and they too found a substantial increase in the number of children who were having 
um, pediatric um, pulmonary embolism. And that was from 2001 to 2014. And then most recently, um, Sarah O'Brien and her group looked um, kind of an update to Dr. Ruffini's original study. And there was a 130% increase in the rates of hospital acquired BTE. And that was from 2008 to 2019. So in sum, there's been more than a 200% increase in the rates of hospital acquired BTE in children over the last decade. And that is very important because we all know that BTE and its recurrence can be associated with significant morbidity and some mortality. So in total, as pediatricians, we just need better preventative um, techniques to keep children from having recurrences. And kind of leading into this slide, we know that the majority, over 90% of thromboses in children are provoked fortunately, by some transient risk factor. Thus, there is a low risk of recurrence, maybe around 1% or so. However, there are children who have higher risk for recurrences due to the persistence of um, more chronic risk factors, to name a few, central venous catheters, excuse me, thrombophilia, as well as cancer. Um, and those children have been shown to have higher rates, up to 30%. Next slide, please. So the Kids Dot trial, for those who may be unfamiliar, this was published um, in January of 2022, but it was a randomized trial to look at how we treat children in terms of duration. We have previously extrapolated a lot from our adult colleagues, but do children really need um, the full three months at minimum or are some children eligible for six weeks? Um, next slide, please. And this study ultimately showed that six weeks was not inferior to um, the three-month treatment in a very specific subset of children. And here I highlight the inclusion and exclusion criteria just to give you a sense of what population we were dealing with when we conducted the secondary analysis. So basically it was open to children up to um, 20 years of age with a provoked VTE. Um, they couldn't have had a prior VTE. Malignancy was included um, provided that it was um, in remission. And there are some other um, exclusion criteria to include those with more significant thrombophilias, again, because those kids are at higher risk at baseline. And over to the right, you see just a diagram to show that at six weeks, children were randomized based on their imaging to see whether or not they could stop at six weeks or where they randomized to three months. And then for those who still had complete vessel occlusion, along with persistently um, positive antiphospholipid antibodies, they were not eligible for randomization, but instead were followed in a parallel cohort and treated at the discretion of their um, provider. Next slide, please. So bringing us to this current study, our objective was really to see in a real world setting what we are doing um, in terms of secondary anticoagulation or prophylaxis for children who've had a, an initial provoked VTE, but may require for various reasons, additional anticoagulation. And this again was using the multinational kids dot trial that enrolled 532 children. Next slide, please. So we conducted a secondary analysis. We, um, in addition to the, the primary data set, we did additional, um, a tertiary database to gather even more specific and detailed information from the, the sites of those that did receive secondary anticoagulation, because a lot of this was not the focus of the primary trial. And definitions, we define secondary anticoagulation as any anticoagulant used beyond the initial treatment period, whether they were randomized to the six weeks or the full three months. And this was for the purpose of secondary VTE prevention. And this was as documented in the case report forms. We termed it chronic if it began within two weeks of the end of that prescribed treatment course and any other anticoagulant use two weeks or longer away from that end of treatment was termed episodic. Next slide, please. So our results show that, and if you could click there, I have some animations. Um, so in terms of age, so in the the second to the last column on the right, we see that that's the cohort. There were 18 out of the 532, so about 3% that received secondary anticoagulation. And the first thing that you see is that those children were older. The median age was 12.9, um, as opposed to 7.8 in those who didn't receive secondary anticoagulation, which was consistent with the overall, where the median age was eight. Next, please. 
The other thing I wanted to point out is in, in terms of race, um, we had a predominance of white or Caucasian um, populations, which is important as you are extrapolating results and whether or not, you know, everything can be applied to the general population given who our cohort consisted of. Next, please. And when we look at those who didn't receive secondary anticoagulation versus those who did, um, the most common site for VTE in those who did was upper extremity at 50%, as opposed to those who didn't require secondary anticoagulation or who didn't receive it, the most common index VTE site was the lower extremity. Next slide, please. Now moving a little further into even more of the characteristics of what exactly was um, done in terms of secondary anticoagulation. Um, the most common anticoagulant used was low molecular weight heparin. And that doesn't come as a surprise as this trial um, initiated, it predated the, the introduction of the direct oral anticoagulants or DOAC in pediatrics. And so by far the majority were low molecular weight heparin at 78%, but there were a, a handful who received um, vitamin K antagonists, specifically warfarin. Next, please. When you look at the modality, and so this was the chronic versus episodic, were people keeping the children on it, you know, indefinitely, or was this, um, you know, just during those, you know, higher risk times where we feel that their baseline risk is further increased, whether it was hospitalization or whatever, um, and the majority did receive episodic. And per the protocol, secondary anticoagulation was allowed up to a maximum of six months, but it was not dictated by the study. It was purely at the discretion of the treating provider. Next, please. And when you look at the indication for secondary anticoagulation, central venous catheters were um, the most at 28%. And if you remember just um, on the prior slide, the children who received typically had upper extremity as their index VTE site. So it's no surprise, the majority of those probably were line associated and likely children who had an indication, whether it was TPN dependence or any other number of things that would have required a chronic indwelling central venous catheter. And next please. And when you look at those who received secondary anticoagulation, none of them had any clinically relevant bleeding or recurrent VTE during or after their course of secondary anticoagulation. And this is important because we have known that anticoagulation in children, which may vary from what we see in our adult counterparts, is that it's fairly well tolerated. We do not have a lot of bleeding. And more importantly, looking at efficacy, now we have more data to suggest, you know, that children tolerate well, but it is also effective. Next slide, please. So in summary, we found that the use of secondary anticoagulation was low amongst the children who were enrolled in the kids that trial. Again, this comes as no surprise. However, we know that the rates are high and that there are children who do warrant secondary anticoagulation. So again, this serves as preliminary data as we continue to work toward. We in pediatrics lack specific guidelines surrounding the use of secondary anticoagulation. So we are really striving to really characterize this population to go forward to eventually conduct additional studies in a randomized fashion to really inform guidelines so that we can really direct our providers. Right now, things are very haphazard and everyone manages slightly different, but hopefully being able to do so in a more precise way to those who require it and some children may not need it. And so then they could not you know, be having the burden of um, anticoagulation on a daily basis if it's not warranted. And among those who received it, again, they had low risk or no recurrent VTE um, in this cohort, and the clinically relevant bleeding as defined by the ISTH was low. Um, when you look at the future direction of this, again, we need more focused study on the use and outcomes of those, whether it's chronic or episodic secondary anticoagulation to inform future practice so that we can do a better job at preventing VTE in both children and adolescents, as well as our young adults, because a lot of pediatric facilities do um, see children up to age 20. 21 and those who have a history of provoked VTE. Again, things are a little bit more clear when you have unprovoked VTE or if you have recurrent, but we just lack guidance in that area. Um, and so that is why this work was important. And again, just a step in stone to continue to gather preliminary data so that we can support an eventual randomized trial to really look at this more definitively.
Um, thank you for your time. This is all that I have. I um, will not be around for the Q&A. However, if anyone has questions, um, they will provide my email address later on. Please email. I am happy to discuss further or should anyone have any questions um, regarding my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Hope. Um, our next speaker is Keith McRae, and he's going to tee up his slides now. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Jean. And I'd also like to thank the AC Forum for the invitation to speak. Uh, my title here is How to Diagnose and Manage Antiphospholipid Syndrome, which uh, would probably be about a three-day talk. But what I'm really going to uh, focus on is uh, basically three cases that are kind of confusing and controversial and come up may come up in clinical practice and there's not a lot of guideline guidance to uh, address these now before getting into those i'll just say a few words about antiphospholipid antibodies as many of you are aware uh, there's this is a heterogeneous antibody population uh, with both unique and overlapping specificities we have lupus anticoagulants, we have anticardiolipin antibodies, and we have beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies, all in this big basket of antiphospholipid antibodies. Now, there's other antibodies as well, such as prothrombin, phosphatidylserine prothrombin. I won't talk about those today. These antibodies in animals may arise in response to viral peptides, may arise in response to viruses in humans as well. I don't think we know. Uh, the overall incidence in the population is actually two to 4%, but the prevalence of APS, which I'll define further, is about 50 cases per 100,000. Now, I think I'll jump right into my first case here. Uh, this was a 77-year-old woman who presented for an opinion concerning duration of anticoagulation. She'd had a cervical discectomy and fusion six months previously. However, she sat in a chair immediately after surgery and was ambulatory and discharged the following day. One week post-op, though, she presented with right calf pain and chest discomfort. She had a peroneal and cellular vein DVT and actually a pretty extensive pulmonary embolism. She was seen in follow-up. She was placed on apixaban at that time, but seen in follow-up by her hematologist, where she was found to have high levels of anti-beta-2 uh, IgM and anti-cardiolipin IgM. Based on this, she was switched to warfarin, and these were repeated three months later, 12 weeks later, and had risen even further. And she saw another hematologist six months after the initial event who said, this uh, IgM antibody is meaningless. It was a provoked uh, event, and uh, you can stop your anticoagulation. So she came to me for another opinion. Now, before going into that, I'd like to just review with you the revised Sapporo criteria that have been used for APS not really diagnosis is not what they were intended for, but it's often been used that way. It was actually intended for inclusion in clinical trials. But this basically involves vascular thrombosis or pregnancy morbidity in the setting of positivity for one of the three antiphospholipid antibodies that I've mentioned. The ACL antibody should have a medium or high titer greater than 40 GPL or MPL or the 99th percentile, uh, anti-beta-2, positive at the 99th percentile, and these studies should be positive at least 12 weeks apart, twice. Now, more recently, just this year, the European League Against Rheumatism came up with a more extensive so-called criteria, and this, uh, this actually broadens the previous criteria. It brings in microvascular complications that may be associated with APS, such as levito reticularis, et cetera, lividoid vasculopathies, um, and it also brings in cardiac valve thickening and from our hematology side brings in thrombocytopenia. Uh, now they also made changes in the antiphospholipid uh, criteria and they consider patients with a moderate or high positive IgM to not be that significant. They get only one point as opposed to a moderate or high positive IgG in which you get four. And by these criteria to have APS, you need to have three points from the clinical domain shown in blue and three points from the orange domains. So if we look at this patient, they had a macrovascular thrombosis without a real high risk profile, they get three points, but their high positive IgM persistently positive gets only one point on the laboratory. So we would say this patient doesn't have APS. Now, what does that mean? Why do they think IgM is less important? And I don't necessarily uh, agree with this. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, basically, what's the clinical importance of the IgM isotype? And I'll just, I'm not saying this is the highest quality data. It's retrospective, et cetera, but I'll just walk you through it. There's a paper from 2015 that looked like a retrospective analysis of 166 patients. I'm sorry, 106 patients. Of these, they actually found 13, 12.3 that were positive for isolated IgM antiphospholipid antibodies. All were ACLs and beta-2 GP1s. They were all at medium to high levels, and they were actually all persistent over 10 years. There was a high incidence of cerebrovascular disease in the IgM patients, so this wasn't significant. They were older at the time of thrombosis, this was significant, and they had a higher incidence of retinal thrombosis. Now, in another study by Urbanski from 2018, another retrospective analysis, but they had 168 patient uh, series. Uh, of these, 14.3%, similar to Del Ross, had isolated IgM ACL uh, of both types. Again, they were persistent. They remained isolated in most patients. Interestingly, the diagnosis of stroke more frequently led to the APS diagnosis in these APL patients. That was significant. And also interestingly, and I think important, these patients were more commonly treated with aspirin or antiplatelet therapy alone uh, if they had IgM. Uh, 14 out of 20 versus 28 of the 134 without isolated IgM. And this was also true in stroke. In patients with stroke, <clears throat> nine of the 10 IgM patients versus 10 of 33 non-isolated IgM were treated with antiplatelet therapy alone. Why is that important? Well, if you look at this additional data from their study, you can see that the relapse-free survival of the IgMs alone versus anyone else uh, was actually comparable. In fact, it may have even been uh, more in the IgMs alone, though that was not significant. And then if you look at either IgMs alone, non-isolated IgMs, or all APS patients in this study, and this is, uh, this is mostly for stroke, uh, but you see that the antiplatelet alone did worse. So I think this assumption of the physicians is that IgMs are not meaningful. Let's just give them a little aspirin. You can clearly show, you know, even though this is a small study, that this may not be the right treatment. Uh, now, the, in fairness, there are studies that say IgM antibodies don't mean anything. This is another retrospective study. It's a large study uh, from the Netherlands, but they found only 3.5 to 4 percent, 4.5 of the thrombotic APS patients had isolated IgMs. And when they looked composite, um, not just with isolated IgMs, but G versus Ms, they didn't feel that IgMs was associated with thrombosis in their analysis. These show uh, the uh, IgMs, and they, uh, the only significant assay was this FADIA assay. But I think you might agree that there tends to be certainly high IgM outliers in the other groups, even if not significant. So in summary, I isolated IgM APLs are uncommon in APS. But I think, in my opinion, there's insufficient data to consider isolated IgM APL, particularly at high levels, to be insignificant. I also would argue that using classification schemes for APS as diagnostic tools or therapeutic guides may be misleading. For this patient, I recommended continuing warfarin anticoagulation and periodically reassessing APL levels. Now, the second case is a 59-year-old man who had epilepsy. He'd had it for several years. He had a family history of coronary disease and may have an epileptic focus they were trying to uh, localize. He gave a distant history of antiphospholipid antibodies, but we didn't have documentation, and he was referred to us. So we did antiphospholipid testing. As you can see here, he was triple positive, lupus anticoagulant, high-level IgG and IgM, ACL, and beta-2 glycoprotein 1. So the question was, does he require prophylactic anticoagulation? And if you look at the, on the left here, this is a prospective study by Pengo from long ago that followed triple positive patients who hadn't had thrombosis and found a thrombosis incidence of 5.3% per year, which is really quite substantial. Now, in another prospective study by Rufati, cumulative thrombosis-free survival of any APL was about 2% per year. So even that is, uh, is, is, is rather substantial, not as much as triple positive. Now, there's not been uh, a lot of prospective studies of any sort in APS, but this APL ASA study uh, by Urkian attempted to randomize patients who hadn't had thrombosis but had antiphospholipid antibodies to aspirin versus no aspirin. 
And it turned out that the study was grossly underpowered, primarily because of the low incidence of uh, events in the placebo group shown here. The hazard ratio was only 1.4, and it wasn't significant. They did a parallel observational study in patients who didn't want to be randomized, but were just fouled and had similar events. So this did not show an advantage of aspirin, though, again, it was underpowered. There has been a meta-analysis by Arnaut, and this is the basis for some recommendations on treatment. Uh, they, they found quite a few studies, but the only randomized and prospective studies here were the Urkian study that I already talked to you about, the APL-ASA study. And I think that kind of biases the results, but long story short, they found that there was a small advantage to aspirin against prevention of arterial thrombosis in APL patients, but no advantage for venous thrombosis. Um, so the again, ULAR, we're back to the European League Against Rheumatism. Their criteria or their recommendations are in asymptomatic APL carriers who don't fit classification criteria with a high risk profile or without traditional risk factors, prophylactic treatment with low-dose aspirin is recommended. And their definition of high-risk uh, high profiles is shown here. The presence of, uh, basically the presence of lupus anticoagulant or double or any combination of antiphospholipid antibodies or triple positivities, uh, or the presence of persistently high APL titers. Now, I'm not quite sure what that last means whether that applies to a single positivity, we don't know. But basically, they're talking about triple positive, double positive, uh, and uh, uh, persistent positive. So in summary, this patient, any way you look at it, had a high-risk profile, but he really has a pretty benign course. He had probably had this APS history for five or six years, never had any problems. He didn't really have secondary cardiovascular risk factors. So we talked to him pros and cons, and we advised him to consider low-dose aspirin, which he did. We didn't insist on it, however. Now, my last case is a case of direct factor 10A inhibitors. This is a 36-year-old woman. She had an iliofemoral DVT six months ago, no provoking factors, treated with apixaban in urgent care. Three-month laboratory follow-up showed high levels of beta-2 GP1 IgG and anticardiolipin IgG. She was on the apixaban, so lack testing was not done. And she was referred for opinion about need for further anticoagulation, as well as should she remain on apixaban or switch to warfarin. Now, as many of you are probably aware, uh, there have been several studies that have looked at the comparison of rivaroxaban or apixaban versus warfarin and APS. And this is the most uh, widely quoted study, most like this is the TRAP study by Pengo. This was a prospective randomized study, rivaroxaban warfarin. And as you can see here, this study was actually stopped early because of the high preponderance of arterial events, uh, mostly strokes, but also myocardial infarction in the rivaroxaban treated patients. And this was, uh, this was quite significant. Now, another study by Ordi Ross, uh, similar study, patients randomized to rivaroxaban versus vitamin K antagonists. Um, and similar to the TRAP study, they found a higher incidence of arterial events, particularly stroke, which was significant, both per protocol and intention to treat analyses in the patients, significantly higher incidence in rivaroxaban versus vitamin K antagonists. So supportive of the TRAP study as shown here. And finally, there's the Astro APS study uh, that used apixaban instead of rivaroxaban. And in this study, patients were randomized to one or the other. And this study had multiple problems. It was stopped several times because of this early and frequent, you can see that this is days, not months, of, uh, of arterial events, uh, primarily actually all strokes in patients treated with apixaban. So this study was stopped early for futility. Um, and actually, this table is just from the, the history. I put this in to estimate the histories of these patients who entered the studies. And just to make the point that not all of these patients had previous arterial thrombosis. Two of the six or so or seven with thrombosis had actually just had DVTs. So to summarize this, I'll just cut to the chase here. And the FDA actually states that DOACs, or factor 10A inhibitors, are not recommended for use in patients with triple positive APS. That's fine. 
How about double positive patients? How about single positive patients? How about lupus anticoagulants only? That's the most important antiphospholipid antibody in terms of risk. How about if they only had prior venous thrombosis? Data all unclear. And how about if the patient's doing well on factor 10A inhibitors? Well, what does doing well mean? If you look at some analyses, meta-analyses of patients with APS who have been treated with factor 10A inhibitors, the mean time to recurrent events is up to 18 months. So is six months enough, so 12 months enough? I don't know. Um, so I play it safe myself. And in this patient, they're double positive, can't rule out triple positive. She's been on factor 10A inhibitor for a relatively short time. So we recommended that she switch to warfarin and monitor APL levels. So uh, that, is, uh, that is the uh, end of, uh, of my talk. And, and again, thanks for the invitation and thanks for your attention. Thanks, Keith. Our next speaker is um, Jordan Schaefer, who's teeing up his slides now. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. And you're up next, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present a study that uh, on uh, behalf of my uh, colleagues uh, entitled A Comparison of Bleeding Events Among Patients on Apixaban, Rivaroxaban, and Warfarin. Uh, for atrial fibrillation and or venous thromboembolic disease. Here are my uh, disclosures. So um, as uh, this group, I'm sure, uh, aware, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and warfarin are some of the most commonly used oral anticoagulants. Uh, they've been uh, compared to apixaban and rivaroxaban, have been compared to warfarin in landmark uh, clinical trials for the indications of nonvalvular atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolic disease. Uh, however, there's limited direct comparative uh, efficacy studies, uh, and there's limited uh, data in a non-clinical uh, trial uh, setting. So we sought to uh, look at this among our uh, patient group and look at patient characteristics and outcomes with the use of these uh, anticoagulants. Uh, we approached this using the Michigan Anticoagulation Quality Improvement Initiative. Uh, this is a collaborative of uh, six uh, diverse uh, clinics, uh, now slightly more at, in the state of uh, Michigan, uh, represent both academic and community uh, practices in both urban and rural uh, settings uh, with a, a diverse uh, a patient uh, cohort. Uh, six pa uh, again, six clinics uh, contributed warfarin data, uh, four clinics contributed uh, DOAC data. Uh, we used data from uh, January of 2009 through June of 2023 for this study. Uh, data was collected by uh, trained uh, data abstractors using uh, predefined uh, forms, uh, and random chart audits were done by the coordinating uh, center to confirm the accuracy of the uh, chart abstracted uh, data. So uh, this is another view of the uh, study design. We have patients uh, uh, napixaban, uh, rivaroxaban, or warfarin uh, for the indications of non-valvular atrial fibrillation or venous thromboembolic disease. We had at least three months of follow-up data available. We excluded patients that were on other anticoagulants, uh, valvular atrial fibrillation, or uh, insufficient follow-up, uh, and that uh, get, uh, presented our uh, primary study uh, cohort. Uh, patients then underwent a robust uh, propensity match on factors uh, thought to influence the potential uh, outcomes. Uh, we used matching ratios of one to one to three to one. Uh, and this resulted in three uh, comparisons. Uh, one was uh, Pixaban to Warfarin with over 3,000 patients in each arm. Uh, comparison two was uh, Rivaroxaban uh, compared to Warfarin with about uh, 1,400 patients on Rivaroxaban and over 4,000 patients on Warfarin. And then the final comparison was approximately 1,400 uh, matched patients uh, with a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban. So uh, the propensity match included age, uh, sex as defined by the electronic uh, health record, body mass uh, index, uh, substance use, uh, indication for anticoagulation, uh, medical comorbidities, uh, history of bleeding uh, and clotting events, uh, kind of as outlined uh, here. Uh, medications, uh, including uh, aspirin dose, uh, use of estrogen, uh, anti, uh, non-aspirin antiplatelet drugs, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We matched on duration of follow-up. Uh, 
And then for each patient, a uh, modified uh, has blood score was uh, calculated along with the Charleston uh, comorbidity index. Uh, the groups after matching were well uh, balanced and any uh, residual differences uh, were included in the subsequent uh, Poisson regression models. Uh, patients were followed until they were uh, lost to follow-up, uh, discharged from the anticoagulation clinic, the end of the study period, or uh, death. And again, event rates were compared by uh, Poisson regression. Uh, we looked at uh, thrombotic outcomes, uh, including the uh, subtypes uh, listed here, such as uh, venous thromboembolic disease, uh, stroke or TIA, and then other thrombosis, which would include things like myocardial infarction. Uh, we also looked at bleeding outcomes, uh, such as major bleeding using the ISTH uh, criteria, uh, non-major bleeding, emergency room visits, hospitalizations, uh, blood transfusion, and uh, mortality. Uh, we had over uh, 13,000 patients meeting uh, the uh, inclusion criteria, over 3,000 on apixaban, uh, approximately 1,400 on rivaroxaban, and over 8,000 on warfarin. Uh, the average uh, age was approximately 67 and 51% uh, identified as male. Uh, so uh, this is our pre-matching uh, characteristics. Again, uh, before uh, the propensity matched, uh, you can see that uh, approximately 80% uh, of apixaban uh, uh, users and 90% of rivaroxaban users were on a standard dose, which for apixaban we defined as uh, five milligrams uh, twice daily and rivaroxaban was doses of uh, 20 milligrams uh, daily. Uh, we weren't able to assess you know, the appropriateness of dose reductions uh, lower th uh, than that at, at, this, uh, at this point. About a third of the patients were on concomitant aspirin therapy and uh, approximately uh, half of patients uh, had a BMI greater than uh, 30. Uh, tobacco use, uh, in former tobacco use in about a third of the uh, patients. Uh, here's a breakdown again of the pre-matching uh, data for indication uh, for anticoagulation. I'll highlight that time in the therapeutic range on warfarin uh, was approximately 60%. Uh, Patients were followed for over uh, two years uh, on average, uh, uh, median follow-up, uh, and uh, comorbidity scores, again, were uh, fairly similar. So now we'll kind of look at some of the uh, results. Um, on the vertical axis, you have adjusted events per 100 uh, patient years. Uh, and this first comparison is a pixaban in yellow and warfarin in green. Uh, we observed uh, increased uh, major uh, bleeding with warfarin uh, compared to apixaban with 4.7 events per 100 patient years compared to uh, 3.4 uh, with apixaban. Uh, we didn't uh, see a difference in non-major bleeding. Uh, when we looked at emergency room visits, uh, we saw increased uh, emergency room visits uh, with uh, warfarin uh, relative to apixaban at 13.4 compared to 11.5. Uh, thrombotic events, uh, we saw more with apixaban at 2.6 events uh, per 100 patient years compared to 2.1 uh, with warfarin. This was largely driven by other thrombosis uh, in uh, the thrombotic uh, subtypes. And then um, mortality, uh, we observed a higher mortality rate with uh, warfarin uh, treated patients at 4.4 events per 100 patient uh, years uh, compared to uh, 3.7 with the Pixaban. So uh, shifting to the next uh, comparison, now comparing, uh, comparing rivaroxaban and warfarin, uh, we see uh, differences here in any uh, bleeding. Uh, 37.9, uh, uh, so uh, rivaroxaban in blue, warfarin remains in green. Uh, so uh, rivaroxaban, we see uh, 37.9 events per 100 patient years for any bleeding uh, compared to 24.9 uh, events per 100 uh, patient years with warfarin. Uh, again, increased uh, major bleeding observed with rivaroxaban compared to warfarin. Uh, then non-major bleeding uh, was similarly uh, uh, higher uh, in the rivaroxaban-treated uh, group. Uh, looking at other uh, outcomes, we did not uh, observe any a uh, significant difference in emergency room visits, hospitalizations, thrombosis, or uh, mortality. Uh, so uh, again, now uh, shifting to the final comparison of rivaroxaban, still in blue, and a pixaban in yellow, uh, we observed higher uh, bleeding uh, events with uh, rivaroxaban at 37.9 events per 100 patient years 
uh, compared to 25.7 events per 100 patient years uh, with the Pixaban. Uh, we saw increased uh, major bleeding uh, with rivaroxaban relative uh, to apixaban, 4.7 versus 2.6. Uh, and then looking at some of our other outcomes, uh, we uh, had more, uh, higher uh, event rates of emergency room visits uh, with uh, rivaroxaban relative to apixaban. And we observed uh, mortality, uh, no difference in uh, thrombosis, but observed uh, mortality would be slightly uh, higher with rivaroxaban relative to apixaban in this study. So uh, strengths of this uh, study, it's a large, uh, robust uh, data set with uh, both bleeding and thrombosis uh, outcomes using real world uh, data. Uh, the limitations are those inherent to observational uh, data, including uh, the potential for unadjusted confounding and selection bias. Uh, the study was likely underpowered for some uh, subtypes of thrombotic and bleeding uh, outcomes. It was a geographically uh, limited uh, uh, patient population, uh, all in the uh, state of uh, Michigan with demographics that uh, reflect that. Uh, data on myocardial infarction may not have been well captured throughout the uh, study period. We don't have uh, data on adherence, uh, which has been uh, a discussion between uh, twice uh, daily uh, administered apixaban compared to daily uh, rivaroxaban. Uh, so we were not able to adjust for that. Um, so uh, overall, um, in conclusion, for patients, you know, on oral anticoagulation uh, for atrial fibrillation, non-valvular atrial fibrillation and or venous thromboembolic disease, we observed the highest bleeding with rivaroxaban followed by warfarin and then apixaban. Uh, thrombosis was higher with apixaban compared to warfarin, seemingly larger, largely driven by other thrombotic events, uh, which was, uh, can, could include arterial thrombosis, uh, intracardiac thrombosis, systemic embolism. Uh, thrombotic event rates were otherwise uh, similar between the groups. Uh, and then we observed uh, Pixaban to be associated with lower uh, mortality than Rivaroxaban and Warfarin. All these studies uh, would need to be confirmed uh, with randomized uh, controlled trials, uh, which uh, might be uh, seen in the future. But uh, in the meantime, this could have some uh, implications for anticoagulation uh, selection. And uh, here's some references. I'd be happy to take any uh, questions. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody involved with uh, making this uh, study uh, possible, uh, including all the representatives of the Michigan Anticoagulation Quality Improvement Initiative. Uh, so. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, we're delighted to have you both join us uh, back here. Uh, and Naomi will join us as well uh, to uh, field the number of questions that we have in the question and answer uh, uh, chat box. Uh, if you have questions, please continue to uh, type them in. Uh, we do have, uh, as potentially predicted by uh, Keith McRae, a significant number of questions about antiphospholipid uh, testing, management, treatment. Uh, and I think that speaks to the difficulty in making the diagnosis and management, but we also have uh, questions for you, Jordan. So uh, we're going to get started. Uh, it, and because there are so many, I, I think uh, some of the uh, common themes uh, will will be addressed. And, and one of the first ones, Keith, uh, yeah, I think is wh when do you think about testing for antiphospholipid antibodies, right? Like we have questions, you know, should it, should it be provoked? Do you, when do you test? Should you test, you know, three or six months later? Should you test at the beginning? What, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a good question. And there's really no uh, right or wrong. It's, you know, it's, uh, they actually, you know, the incidence of antiphospholipid antibodies is actually higher in older people than younger people. Um, on the other hand, I don't know if they have as much meaning. So the problem with, uh, you know, lupus anticoagulant testing is when someone is on anticoagulation, it's harder to test for that without stopping anticoagulation. So, and, uh, and the other uh, assays are immunologic the uh, cardiolipin beta-2 glycoprotein-1. So I don't think there's really any convincing data that thrombosis changes those levels. There's some older data that suggests that they lower them temporarily. But I think that if you are going to test, I think, um, you know, even before uh, 
anticoagulation is started, if you have a high suspicion or any particular suspicion, is probably a good time to test. Um, who do I test? Um, you know, I think of uh, it, it, they are the most common acquired cause of recurrent thrombosis. So, uh, and they do have meaning uh, in terms of recurrence has been shown by many studies. So I, um, I test relatively widely. I mean, if somebody clearly is vasculopathic and has had uh, a good reason, uh, you know, they just had their leg in a cast for three months, I, I might not test. Although again, you can pick them up there too. So I would, I, I would, I kind of take it on a case by case basis, but I have a low threshold, put it that way. It's hard to pinpoint exactly who, but after you've seen enough of these patients, you, you sort of your threshold drops. Do you think that ordering a, there's a question from Scott Cates about ordering a beta two GP one and anticardiolipin antibodies in patients with non provoked acute VTE when they are on anticoagulants? to guide DOAC versus warfarin. And I'm gonna extrapolate a little bit with that question, right? We, we admonish people not to test for the inherited thrombophilias at the time of acute VTE, right? Because protein C, protein S and antithrombin levels may be affected um, by the acute clot, but also because in the presence of, of anticoagulants, those tests can be affected. So what do you think about upfront testing and, and sort of getting back to something in one of your cases, how long do we have, um, this is part two, if someone is in, is on a DOAC to switch them over to warfarin? So do you test for, how early do you test once they've had a non-provoked VTE? And what's your what, anxiety about switching them over? You may have hinted, you know, how long is long enough? Is it 18 months? But love to hear more detail about that thought process. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So my answers are clearly opinion. Um, uh, and clearly, there's no, no problem in testing for ACLs or beta twos in even around the setting of a, of a relatively acute thrombosis. They're really, in my opinion, not significantly affected. They're immunologic tests. So they're, they're basically just ELISAs or, or some other immunologic test. Um, so I think those can be test tried anytime. And I think it might, yes, it might uh, change the uh, the type of anticoagulation the patient is on. Um, and, uh, you know, if I see a patient who has these antibodies and has been on, uh, you know, a non-vitamin uh, K antagonist anticoagulation after three months, um, you know, particularly if they're a younger patient or doesn't seem to have a lot of risk factors and it's unprovoked, as Scott mentioned, um, I will test then too. I don't really have a cutoff time. Um, I suppose maybe if they've been on for two years or something and they're doing really well, I, I might not test, I might not think about changing then. But again, I mean, APS, if it's truly APS, these antibodies can go away with time, but uh, it is uncommon for that to happen. Um, so, uh, and I think uh, particularly for arterial events, um, I do believe that VKAs are better drugs. So I, I will extend that time quite a, quite a long time. Thank you. Jordan, a question for you. Um, uh, one of them is any opinion on why rivaroxaban seems to be associated with increased bleeding versus apixaban? This is something that seems to come up in multiple observational studies. W what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, that's a good uh, good question. The um, it's been you know there's been a question about the pharmacokinetics of the drug and the you know dosing interval with uh, once daily with uh, rivaroxaban uh, compared to twice daily with uh, apixaban. If that could explain things, uh, all the data that's out there uh, seem to be showing similar. Uh, findings, but again, it's all observational in nature. So, you know, there's been questions about the underlying selection of uh, the drugs uh, themselves, uh, if there's some underlying, you know, selection bias and in, in who is getting uh, prescribed which uh, anticoagulant. Uh, so I, th I think there's a need to kind of further explore this. You know, I think uh, there's ongoing trials looking at this uh, question. And then from the uh, mechanistic side, I, I think people are interested in this, but there's nothing uh, well established. 
And and along those lines, um, if you have somebody who's bled on an anticoagulant, uh, particularly rivaroxaban, what would your strategy uh, be in that situation? Does this information inform your decision making? Yeah, I think the first, uh, you know, step is is looking at, you know, what, uh, on, you know, often we are seeing patients with uh, bleeding risk factors that aren't mitigated, whether that be uh, concomitant use of uh, other medications that increase bleeding risk, such as aspirin or non anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, you know, improper and consistent use. Uh, drug drug interactions with the the DOEX are. Uh, not un you know uncommon to to see that may uh, you know mitigate uh, some of you know moderate some of the uh, bleeding uh, observed. Uh, I don't tend to um, some some in practice if someone has uh, bleeding on uh, one of the anticoagulants, I don't commonly switch uh, between uh, 10A inhibitors, but um, you know it's something uh, to discuss. I think there's more data in the depending on the certain type of bleed. I think gastrointestinal bleeding, in, in particular, uh, and bleeding subtype has been uh, you know potentially observed uh, differences. Uh, and then also, I think it's important to look at gastrointestinal anatomy as well uh, for patients that have had uh, gastrointestinal uh, surgeries, and including like where the uh, drugs are uh, absorbed. Uh, but sometimes after a bleed, I'll, I'll switch to something that's a little bit easier to monitor uh, if that's a if it's a concern for the anticoagulant it's, itself, or even if ongoing anticoagulation is appropriate, uh, depending on the specifics of the patient. One last question for you, Jordan, that comes from one of our AC Forum board members, so, so I can't resist. Uh, and and I will I can then tell you my perspective from my role as medical director of our anti-coag service. But um, Arthur Allen thought that your TTR um, was somewhat low by today's standards. Do, do you know what your center TTR is for your for your six consortium there in Michigan? And, and is that uh, the sixty percent, I think, is what you quoted. Um, your average, or um, how how do you, how does that compare to what you might see today, compared yeah. to say a decade ago when warfarin management might have been a little different? Yeah, I think uh, you know. I think the the TTR in, is similar to some other uh, you know studies of of similar similar patient populations. It does include over a decade of data. Uh, you know, including patients that may have had, uh, it's something we could look at to see if uh, TTR, our current, uh, I believe our current TTR is uh, higher than that at our uh, center uh, for most patients. But uh, again, there's, uh, you know, sometimes other, you know, and I, I think this is something, you know, uh, to look at, you know, for anticoagulation management in general is how, you know, uh, uh, various disparities and who's, you know, uh, getting uh, warfarin and, and some of the challenges that can come up with monitoring uh, warfarin uh, appropriately, whether that be, you know, just, you know, I think we've seen some differences in uh, disadvantaged uh, groups uh, having lower uh, TTRs uh, than uh, patients uh, without, uh, you know, certain uh, disparities. So I, th I think that's also an uh, issue, you know, we, we've been looking at using uh, home INR monitors, uh, some other types of uh, strategies to improve uh, time in the therapeutic uh, range as, as well, especially for patients that might have difficulty uh, monitoring their uh, warfarin. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm sorry to, to, to give you the second part of our Arthur's question is, do, and you may not have this data, but this may be something you want to look at, is... Um, do you know whether the trend was, you know, sub-therapeutic uh, INRs or super-therapeutic, and did th that fraction correlate with bleeding or thrombotic risk, but particularly bleeding with the high INRs? Yeah, um, I we haven't uh, looked at that, but I think that's something uh, that we uh, should uh, take a look at. I, you know, that I know of in, in this in this particular analysis, we haven't uh, looked at that. Uh, but I think that's something uh, that we can uh, uh, take a look at in the future. Uh, I was actually answering one of the questions. We don't have a comparable, you know, adjustment of drug levels or uh, organ function for all of the uh, DOEC uh, treated uh, patients. So it's hard to, you know, exactly compare, you know, if uh, there was some change in renal or hepatic function for DOEC treated patients around the time of bleeding or uh, some new drug interaction that could be, you know, uh, impacting bleeding on the for the DOAC treated patients. Uh, but on the warfarin uh, you know treated side, I, I think there likely is an association between uh, you know the uh, TTR and uh, INRs around the time of bleeding events uh, that we would find.
Great. Yeah, no, a lot of a lot of data that you can delve through there to get us more answers to these important questions. But Keith, um, uh, Jordan brought up the point of care testing issue. And there's a question in the chat about, do you use point of care PTINR testing or INR testing for your patients with antiphospholipid antibodies? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, uh, <clears throat> that's a great question. And I do, I do frown on that. Uh, I mean, it's well known that point of care testing uh, can, can give markedly discrepant results from venipuncture blood draws for INRs. And then when you go to home testing, it's even worse. So I do have maybe one or two patients who use this, but uh, before I would approve it, I have actually a, a venipuncture INR and a point of care INR, which is a, with the machine they'll be using, done on the very same day. And I like to do that at least once, if not twice, and uh, and to confirm that whatever point of care testing they're doing gives you an equivalent result to a venipuncture INR. And if it does, I grudgingly agree to it. Um, yeah. I do the same, quite honestly. So I'm actually glad to to hear you say that um, because I, I, you know, the point of care testing for for the person who um, put the question in the chat um, gets nonlinear once you get below 1.5 and above four, and we already know that there can be interference from the APLA in the the sample and and the the test strips are just not set up to to account for that. So um, we we tend to do the same, but but not uh, everybody I, recognizes that. No, I've actually uh, had a couple of patients with therapeutic INRs by venipuncture with point of care INRs of six at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I think Adam Sucker did a study once just about variability of INRs, but I'm getting us off target here. <laughs> so question for you, Keith, about uh, patients who present with arterial events and you've determined that they uh, have APS. Do you recommend warfarin alone? Do you add aspirin? When do you add aspirin? Um, th this question has been asked by a number of different uh, attendees for our webinar. Um, what, how, what's your strategy for, for that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. It's a, it's a, it's a common problem and uh, there's no real comparative studies. Um, I think the two approaches that people have proposed are to maybe three approaches is to drive the INR to three to four range instead of two to three um, to use uh, to use uh, warfarin plus aspirin or, or to uh, drive the INR to three to four and use aspirin and uh, I personally uh, I, I don't really like INRs of three to four myself. Um, you know, it's, it's hard enough to be in a TTR with two to three. Um, so, but I do, I think there is evidence. Uh, there is some data, even from a small prospective study. Most of your arterial events will be strokes in, in this disease. So I think there is evidence, and I, I think I showed some in my talk, actually, that uh, warfarin plus aspirin seems to be better than warfarin alone or aspirin alone. So. My approach to that is usually warfarin to INR two to three plus aspirin. I'm so not... even up front when they first present and you, you know, because this question comes up in our practice, someone comes in, neurology has appropriate with a stroke, neurology has appropriately tested ACL and beta two and their sky high values. Um, and my approach is don't wait for those three months, right? Um, you know, like don't put them on a DOAC or put them on aspirin alone and wait three months. Let's start VKA. But I, I do agree that the, there is the question of whether we should add aspirin first or wait till they have a recurrence. And so it sounds like you would suggest adding aspirin at the at when you initiate warfarin. I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's, that may be the way to go. And we would love to get data uh, on that. Um, we are starting to wind down um, with about one minute left. Um, I think we've captured some of the major questions here. Uh, I think there are many, many questions. We still have over 20 unanswered. Uh, and so for those of you who have burning questions and want our um, 
advice, even if there's no real data to back it up, please email us. Uh, you can reach us through AC Forum. Uh, we will share email addresses. Uh, I think, as Keith said wisely uh, uh, before his talk, we could talk about this for three days. Uh, so, uh, and Jordan, I think there are a lot of questions uh, about uh, your data as well and, and how do we move forward and learn more. Um, Lots to do, guys. Uh, look forward to hearing from you next year uh, on these topics. Uh, and so I want to thank uh, Hope in absentia. I want to thank Naomi for helping to field these questions and Jordan and Keith for, for a great uh, presentation and a great Q&A today. And most importantly, thank the audience. Um, we have a few more uh, slides um, with some updated uh, information about upcoming uh AC Forum, if I can get there fast enough, uh, information, uh, please check out our website uh, with regard to uh, upcoming events uh, sponsored by AC Forum, uh, and do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, let me just um, harass my computer here. Uh, actually. Uh, this may not be the best way to uh, accomplish this. Uh, so I'm going to end there and we will uh, send you our uh, last slides and our updated announcements for the AC Forum. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. <laughs>